So we're here at the Grey Nichols factory, Ollie. Um, I'm fascinated. How do you go about choosing your bats? Yeah, so for the last um, probably four years now, I've used I've always used a shorter blade uh, with a normal length handle. I just feel like it picks up a bit lighter. Um, and that's something that is, you're seeing quite a lot now. Quite a few guys in the changing room ha- uh, do that. And then gradually just tinker. Sometimes you'll, you might score runs and score 100 or a couple of big innings and then mm. with one specific bat and then you'll just like the feel of it. And then you'll go, right, this is my template this is what i want i want this curve in it i want this weight in it i want this kind of handle um but that can change the whole time like at the minute i just like mine slightly more rounded fairly light not too bulky but still enough behind it um and then yeah and then it's yeah like i said it's constantly changing but it's you just get a feel for one bat Mm. it's not always the one that pings the best for me especially in red bull cricket it's just the one that feels right in my hands Mm. so we're going to talk technique um As a club cricketer, I'm always interested in how much do pros talk about technique in the dressing room? And as a batter, when you make changes to your game, is that something that you are having thoughts about in the nets or is that do you make changes based on conversations with with, um, coaches? So I just, yeah, what what is the evolution of a batter like? Yeah, you you see it with a lot of different players. Like I think someone like Joe Root's the perfect example. He's constantly making tiny adjustments to his game, but with keeping the same basics. And I think that's something batters learn along the way. You you want to, it's easy to look up to your idols and look up to the guys you've grown up watching and be like, I want to bat like him, but you mm. need your own template. What works for Ollie Pope, not what works for someone else. Um, so constantly tinkering. I think it can change slightly from where you go. For example, in India, I mean, the perfect example is I spent, uh, I was injured obviously before India for three months. I was netting, training for my trigger for reverse swing bowling, trying to stay a little more open and then suddenly got out in the game. And what I'd been doing for three months before, I ended up just going with this new trigger because it just felt right in the game. And that, that was the innings that I had a bit of success in. So I think that that kind so that of... was mid inning. So you, you were preparing for something for three months and then mid innings you worked out that wasn't quite working. Not even mid innings. I think it was might have been one ball. And I think Boomer was bowling reverse swing and Siraj had it reversing. So I was like, right, I'm just going to trigger with my back leg, keep my left leg out of the way. And it's yeah. like just shows that sometimes there's an element of just feel in the game, but I, it's very rare for me. Um, so at the same time, so then I kind of got back to England and for example, I, I was like, is this the way for me to go? And then mm. being honest, like I've, that's, it's, it's not, it doesn't work for me in England. I played one game, played one county game last week. I got out once doing it and, mm. I, and I've, I immediately know I need to just go back to the way that I've playing, which is a normal two-legged trigger, nice and simple. Um, I get my sort of weight and my balance a little bit better there. I can move forward and back a bit better. So you're constantly wanting to get better. I did that because I was cautious of reverse swing and your, your pads and your stumps and it's, it's never going to be easy out there. I think there's a good video or picture going around of me with my two stumps on the floor. <laughs> so it doesn't always work. <laughs> um but at the same time yeah it's just trying to realize what's the biggest risk um in india that was the case so yeah that was my work on and then in england it's slightly different it might be a bit more swing um a bit more nip so it's trying to work out what's best for me here so i like to just try and do all my work well away from the cricket in mm. an ideal world do it for two or three weeks before and then come come the game then you you know exactly how you're going to go into it and you don't really want to be think, thinking about your technique in these big games you'd rather just have a clear mind and just go in and play the situation not just where my feet where my head mm. where my hands um so i've got two stills one of you uh, at Lords in your test debut against India in 2018 uh, and then one against Australia also at Lords last summer talk me through the changes here so looking at the one from your test debut you're slightly more offside I think the other notable thing is you're, you're, you're more crouched back in 2018 compared to where you were last summer um, talk me through those changes and when do those changes take place etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah I think so I'm actually so the the legs the the sort of bend in the legs I realized I was just getting too tense in my legs I mm. wasn't I wasn't moving smoothly enough I wasn't sort of getting enough power and just too crouched down and it just brought too much like tension within my body so I reckon probably after I got dropped from the England team after a couple of games for the first time that was when I I realized that I needed to try and change that so gradually I think I probably made that adjustment probably over the next few months after getting dropped and also my I mean that's not perfect I mean that's probably that's probably when I got bowled as well actually 
Um, but I'm trying to just keep my head a little bit more that way. I mean, if you look at where my balance is there, mm. um, it just looks like I'm falling over to the offside and, and that's just going to basically mean my back can't come down in a nice straight line. Um, but this is a, I know whether it was, not, was the ball I got bowled. Yeah, it wasn't actually. But that that's a much better position. I mean, the reason I got bowled was because I saw a wobble seam ball coming down, but it swung in when I didn't expect it to swing. So that is the reason I got in a bad position. But that's a better position for me now because my balance is just much better. And I think other examples will be used as well when I'm over the wicket and my balance will be in a better position. And and then I think the two things for me that I'm worried, well, probably three things in my head, my hands, I want to have a nice clear back path where it's nice and simple. When you hit a straight drive or a cover drive, it just looks like almost gravity is taking over and mm. it's just all moving kind of in one line. Um, and also I want my feet. So for the left arm seamer, I want to be just slightly open like that. And then for a right arm, uh, pro- pretty much parallel towards the bowler. So mm. that that's kind of what works for me when I'm playing my best. Things look pretty simple that way. And that's mm. sort of my template of how I want it to look. So yeah, nice and simple with the head, yeah. hands. and But again, still kind of things that I work on and, and things that you can keep improving and just trying to sort of find drills to help improve that. So what are the drills that, that, you, that are your go-tos? Yeah, so I'll do each morning. I like to just do some basic stuff every morning of a game. I don't necessarily hit with a sidearm. Uh, I'll just get my pads on, pads and gloves uh, and a box and just get some throws and just hit some nice defences because I think it's easy in the season. We're constantly playing, especially in the county season and then going into the test summer. And actually now with T20 and the 100 kicking about, it's good to, for me as a test cricketer, it's good for me just to keep nailing my basics. So I'll just block block a load of balls for five minutes and then hit a few drives where I try and hit sort of extra cover and then I'll clip a few and hit a few on mm. drives as well. And that's just a good way. It's, it's pretty easy to do. Like I'm... I'm not expe- I'm expecting to middle most of these balls um and it's something that keeps it nice and simple in the morning and it just keeps my and my focus basically just my head position and mm. just being clear with my footwork and my and precise with my footwork as mm. well um a couple of is it two years ago now or three years ago uh, the off stump guard was almost a national culture war issue so you were batting an off stump then what was your thinking behind it and and why did you move back so more middle stump. Yeah, I think so. I realised so my weakness uh, then was was probably that sort of fifth stump channel um, and nicking balls on that fifth stump channel um, because I was just, my hands were getting too pushy. So my theory behind it then was, um, right, if I shuffle across a bit and I know if, if I'm on off stump and the ball's pretty not much, not hitting my legs, then I can leave it, mm. leave the ball easier. And then, um, and because I was good off my pads um, and so that that was the theory behind it and then I kind of when I got dropped from England got after the Ashes series away um came back and worked on my game had a long chat with Vikram Solanke who was the head coach at Surrey at the time and we're like right well just stick with one thing because at at that time I was just tinkering 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 and that's that wasn't the right thing for me to do um so I was like right I'll stick to batting on middle I might trigger just to just to middle and off um Mm. but then that as long as you can know where your off stump is, I think that that can then solve those problems. And I'm not saying it was definitely the right or wrong thing to be standing on off stump at the time I got out. Southy got me out once LBW, so it looked like the wrong thing. But yeah, I think that, that there's always a thought behind mm. it. It's not just, oh, I'll stand on off stump and just clip everything off my legs. It's like, right, how can I neg- negate my weakness? But then again, one of my biggest strengths is playing through the offside. So it's not getting too wound up in how they're going to get you out, but it's actually trying to work out how how you can score a run. So I, mm. I'm, I cut and I play my cover drives. And then if I can just keep learning where my off stump is, I can leave those balls on fist stump a lot better. So that was that was the theory behind it. Um, Someone like Australia might happen a bit more because a lot of the balls are bouncing over the stumps. But I think for now, what's worked best over the last few years is, yeah, me just standing on middle, triggering sort of to middle and off and... Mm. and I mean we're talking about margins of an inch so yeah. but they they do make a difference and in your mindset with how you want to go about an innings as, as you played more test cricket did you make technical changes based on the different challenges so Rob Key talks about it a lot that you have more 90 mile per hour bowling you have taller bowlers generally more more bouncing pitches as well did was there any was there anything that you did 
almost specifically for the challenges that you get in test cricket and, and do you even set up now slightly different in test cricket versus county championship stuff yeah absolutely i think in so with quicker bowlers so i worked out i was getting slightly hurried on the short ball so i now i try and pick my hands up a bit more which helps me in probably more test cricket if i'm mm. being honest um and that can help me just get onto the pull shot quicker. And then if you think about it, my, if your hands are low on when the ball is releasing the ball and it's a weird concept, but if you, if you've got to go up and then back down, then you're probably going to be on the move when you're defending a little bit. So I've, when I'm playing my best at the minute, I'm just trying to keep them fairly high. I think you see it with a lot of batters now, fairly high. And then all it's got to do, whether I'm, if I'm on the pull shot, then they're already set up for that, but also they've just got to come with a nice clear path back down, if that makes sense. So that's something Test Cricket's probably helped me with and sort of helped me learn my game with. Um, and as well, in general, the pitches are slightly better in Test Cricket. I mean, they've, I've, over the last year or two, they've been pretty good in county cricket as well, to be honest, but there's less of a challenge where the bowlers are just kind of trying to nip it in and every ball and hit your pad there's there's a bit more pace and a bit more swing um often i find in test cricket so a lot of time in county cricket if i feel the ball's nipping almost like a ridiculous amount i'll mm. just walk down down the crease and try and find a way to put the bowler under pressure and try and get outside the line but if you're playing on good pitches I, you don't really have to do that as much but yeah, I was going to ask that. That is um, something you do probably more than most batters coming down down the ground. Is that a deliberate decision for just when it nips about, or yeah? Um... I mean, it's it's a, one of two things. It can either be to put the bowler under pressure and try and if he's really settled in at bowling the top of the stumps and trying to basically make his best ball into a half volley so I can score off it. And it's also if I feel like he's really challenging me, nipping it in. But at the same time. I, it's still something that I'm working out um, when when's the best time to do it um, because I, I do it well, but uh, I've fallen into that trap a couple of times as well. So it's making sure I trust my defense. And for me, it's probably a little bit more now using it just to f every now and again to put the bowler under pressure. So he knows that mm. he can't just settle in and bowl his best ball. But at the same time, like, do I do it too early in my innings? Sometimes I've fallen into that trap once or twice, which I... And it's just constant learning and constant playing the situation and even chatting to a guy like Joe Root, who's done that a lot as well, is talking to him and he he's sort of worked that out and that's why he's sort of the, the player he is now because he's worked out that side of his game and when to use those kind of counter punches as well. Mm. So that's something I'm definitely still working on. Um, people always uh, call back to, to hundreds, but I think some of your most memorable innings on, on home soil in particular actually are... Um, I think back to you got uh, a 60, 70 odd against Pakistan when they had Shaheen and Nassim and then a 70 odd at Lords against South Africa in, in a game that England didn't do very well in. Um, when your game is going well against the, the proper quicks, I think Norkia and Mabad were playing that South Africa game, what do you think is, is working particularly well for you, for you? Yeah, I think probably that, that South Africa series was probably the best. I know I didn't get, like you said, I didn't get those hundreds, but... And then I made a, I think I made a 60 odd at the Oval as well on uh, in a very low scoring game. And I think when what, I was just clear in my mindset, I was happy to every now and again run down to Norkia Rabada, which if- What's that pick, like? I mean, if you pick the wrong ball, you could be cleaned up, yeah. which is an idea. And I didn't have loads of success against it. But again, I was just trying to, because I knew the pitch was doing a fair bit, mm. I was trying to just find a way to put their- best ball which is at the top of the stumps where they on a grassy pitch if he's if they're bowling short at me don't get me wrong it's not that fun but I feel like I can score off it um mm. so it's just a way of me trying to put them under a little bit more pressure so they're other than obviously we lost at Lords one at the Oval but they're probably two of my best knocks in the England shirt because I kind of I was so clear in my mindset there and I I trusted my defense I left well but I also scored at a pretty quick rate um it's almost like you're you're defending as least balls as possible because you're either leaving or trying to score off it. Um, so still making, I made really good decisions in those two innings. Um, and it was just nice and simple. I think when I'm playing my best as well, I kind of just take the pitch out of the situation as well. I know at my best, I can be a good enough player to score on any, any kind of wicket. Um, but it's just trying to be at your best as much as you can because there's other times where you get on a flat one and you, you're out of rhythm and it's like, Jesus, this is, this is tough work. So it's just, 
having confidence and having clarity in your game and the the sort of work you do before the week of a test match week of um or even the month before a test series and so you can kind of go in full of confidence and if there's a pitch that that looks pretty spicy for the and seem a friendly then you can still back yourself to mm. to do well on it uh, i've got to ask you about one of your hundreds 196 at hyderabad joe root who's scored a few big tons in asia described it as one of the best knocks ever played in Asia, I spoke to Ollie Robinson afterwards and he was talking about the preparation you guys had for that tour and in particular what you were doing in preparation for the pitches that would turn more and that Hyderabad pitch arguably spun more than any of the other grounds that you guys played at. Talk us through your prep for that innings. Yeah, I think I had so much clarity in my innings and probably the frustrating reason why I didn't kick on was because I was, I'd probably set up, like you said, that was probably the biggest turner of them all. And I'd probably set up my whole game thinking every pitch was going to be like that. Um, so yeah, the we went out to Abu Dhabi, obviously. And then I think the best thing about, I know there was a lot of chat in the media about it, but we were able to create our own scenarios, game scenarios. We were allowed, allowed to put sand on the wicket and get guys like oh, well, all our spinners, uh, Hartley, Leachy, um, Bash, bowling, um, bowling with, a pitch covered in sand so some balls were skid on and just like that pitch did so I was had so much clarity and I remember I obviously got one in the first innings and I was like I was, at, I was kind of at peace with it because I in my mind I was like right if Jadeja nicks me off or beats me on the outside then you've got to be at peace with that and and that's why I was sort of proud of myself in that game was that I I sort of drew a line under that and I stuck by the same thing I was like right I'm going to do everything I can to cover my inside edge and get in a good enough position that if he does spin it past me I'm not pushing at it hopefully to slip so and he beat me probably a hundred times or whatever during mm. that innings but and and a big then, part of that innings was, was putting those balls away yeah like, there's nothing you can do about yeah them, absolutely so don't worry about that yeah and that was probably what I'd really prepared myself for was right see it go past the bat see it go past the bat and then then throw the odd punch with the sweep or reverse sweep or run down the wicket um so I think it was just a clarity in my mind and I think that's why probably the frustrating thing like I said was that about the rest of the series was the conditions changed a fair bit. My my sweeping game and my uh, and that kind of thing was kind of taken out of it because we played on more up and down pitches and sort of crack crack pitches. They weren't easy to bat on, and against someone like Boomer, it never is. But um, that was probably why I didn't have as the success I wanted throughout the whole series was because I'd been so sort of good at preparing for a real turner, but mm. probably let myself down a little bit just by by not sort of putting enough pressure back on the bowler when we got on slightly better wickets. On the 196, talk me through the scoop of your head. You had Gavaska purring in the commentary <laughs> box. I think it's a shot I don't think anyone's ever played before in a test match. Yeah, I I remember facing, again, that Abu Dhabi trip, I was facing Tommy Harley. He was bowling really nicely with a new ball and I was, try, I was finding it quite hard to sweep and quite hard to reverse sweep. So I, was, I remember... Brendan McCullum was standing at slip and he's not the tall, not the tallest so I was like you know what I can so I just tried it two or three times in Abu Dhabi and I was like oh right that, that works. works and then so I don't know what made me try it in India and then I just remembered I think when I'm playing my best I'm just thinking quite logically I'm not thinking technically I'm like right there's a gap there I could that's a feels like a fairly safe shot and every time I played it fortunately it actually went for four so it's like Right, that was a that was a good option to take and use sort of my logical half of my brain and rather than my technical part. Um and yeah, that that one worked and again, frustrating. I didn't almost play it more during the as as the series went on because it's kinda of like, oh, there's I didn't trust the bounce of the pitches so much, but you've got to take those risks sometimes, I think. Mm. Um you you talked about the rest of your series. Some commentators describe the way you start an innings as frenetic do you think that comment is fair and are you someone who constantly tries to start innings in a, in a busy manner not constantly I think on the pitches like I said the on those kind of pitches that I expected us playing on I knew that sometimes if you're just sort of kind of sitting there sitting there there could be one with your name on it um so my my thing was I was trying to find a way to put some pressure back on the bowler um and annoyingly in the last test I think I only got I, I got 20 and 11 I think um but I actually felt like I started my innings exactly how I wanted to start it and I was kind of learning on the job a little bit um because it's something that I've worked on in England I've worked hard at my game starting my innings in England and that word frenetic I mean when I do well they call it busy when I when I get out it's frenetic so mm. it's like 
it's just sort of how it looks. And it, for me, of course, it's, it's something I can work on. Definitely the first first 20 balls of my innings. Um, and that's probably just trusting my defence, to be honest, um, which I should have done more so in those last couple of games. Um, so it, it sometimes works, it sometimes doesn't. But it's try, for me, it's trying to work out how I can make it work a lot more times than and, it doesn't. And is that one of, those cha- one of the challenges of test cricket in particular is that there are five tests in these big series and you actually have to adapt mid-series yeah absolutely and I think especially with that Indian team um, I think when when teams come to England you know roughly what they're going to throw at you but I mean uh, credit to India they they come at you with I mean the way Boomer bowled was mm. I mean that's probably the toughest on on pretty spinner friendly and some of the pitches batter friendly wickets the way he bowled was very impressive um, and that's another dimension then the way Coldeep came in and he bowled was very impressive as well and then they've obviously got the skills of Ashwin Jadeja um, so that you've almost got to prepare for three times as much as you do in the series in England mm. um, and especially in a five match series because there's so many different ways they're trying to get you out and it kind of felt like every time you you had a little brain slip and you lost focus for that one ball that was the that was the ball they're out because they're keeping so many dismissals in play um so that's what it felt like and you've got to be on your a game throughout the whole the whole thing i think in india um and probably slightly different to other series because you you know roughly what the conditions are going to be like and how they're going to line up and they're going to probably play one spinner and four seamers in a lot of places so i think that's definitely part of it yeah mm. Um, finally, a non-batting question. A lot of the guys in the England dressing room now describe you as, as a leader um, and you're given the vice captaincy at a relatively young age. How do you think you've developed in, into a leader and do you have people that you've looked up to as role models in leadership? Um, yeah, I think part of it sort of just comes naturally to you and who you are on a pitch. I think I know what works well for me is just immersing myself in the whole game. I'm not just a batter. I want to be a good fielder. I want to be help out the captain when I can, if it's my place to help him out. Um, and then I think, yeah, as a, as I think, obviously I've really enjoyed working under Stokes and Stokes and McCullum. Um, and they've given me confidence to sort of be myself, play like I want to play. Um, there's still a lot of work from a personal point of view that can be done. And I still feel like I can be a much better player than I am at the minute. Um, but I feel like that that leadership role sort of helps you grow within the team and within the vir- environment. And there's always going to be a lot of noise in a in a test match whenever you have a low score. But I think the challenge is for me. I think when I got that pair in India, um, that's probably pretty pretty low mo- moment. But I was like, right, well, I can either rock up and sort of go inside, go sort of bit insular and just worry about my own game, or actually, right, I'm vice captain here we've got a job to do on here. So I think it's a good way of cricket's a team sport. Um, like as much as it can feel individual, sometimes it is a team sport and you're all sort of working towards the same goal. There's going to be times where you score zero and times where you score a hundred. So I think it's kind of like you need to just be as consistent as you can. And if that's you being a leader on the pitch and off the pitch, then you need to do it after scoring a hundred runs or zero runs as well. And mm. I think that's probably my, the main thing for anyone who's sort of, growing up and wants to be a leader within a team is just finding that consistency and I think yeah who I've look up, looked up to I mean I think we've obviously got Alex Stewart sorry he's he's been a unbelievable role model for us obviously as a player but as a the way he sort of runs the whole setup at Surrey um is and then even playing under Burnsy slightly different leadership styles someone like Stokesy but it's just it's really good seeing how different different captains operate and i think if you can just sort of pick up snippets of that and then be your own person if it ever does land on my lap and then that's probably my main main focus mm. well cheers your time ollie you've got to go play golf so we'll wrap <laughs> it up there but cheers. thanks a lot and best luck this nice season. one thank cheers, you man. cheers